Dr. Robert Carl is a composer who began his career as a history student at Yale before the centennial celebrations of Charles Ives turned him into a full-time musician. I recently had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Carl about his experiences studying with Yanis Nakis and Betsy Jolas, what postmodernism means for the contemporary musician, how he came to develop his highly personal approach to the harmonic series, and much more. Dr. Carl recently retired from teaching composition at the Hart School at the University of Hartford. He is also the author of Music Composition in the 21st Century, Terry Riley's In C, served as the editor of Jonathan Kramer's Postmodern Music, Postmodern Listening, and has written extensively for Fanfare magazine. Dr. Carl, thank you for being here. You're more than welcome. I'm delighted to be on the show. I want to start with two quotations for context and then a question that follows up on those. Uh, quote one is from Daniel Morell's 2018 thesis on your music. Quote, Whereas Ives' music provided Carl the permission to express himself in music, Zanakis provided a template for how to do so. Carl left Paris conceiving of musical form in completely new ways, such as time-based structures that originated from pitch-based structures. Quote two is from your book, Music Composition in the 21st Century, which is a great read, also about Zanakis. Zanakis, quote, is a composer who creates a different sense of musical space from what we've known before. And the question submitted by Stephen Weigel is this. How did working with Zanakis affect your perception of postmodernism as a philosophical outlook? First of all, Zanakis is not a composer who most people would think of as postmodernist, though you must realize that I am of an age when postmodernism was actually a style with particular technique, and it was very much a matter of sort of cobbling together quotations and references and making um, a statement which referred to both the past, to musics of other cultures, to musics of other, um, how would I say it, other traditions that might be less, uh, uh, quote unquote, elevated. All of that was brought together into a kind of um, stew. And that was, in a way, a sort of classic postmodernism. Um, and I think of like composers like John Corigliano and David Del Tredici uh, and William Balcom as examples of that. But of course, Zanakis has nothing to do with that. He certainly is postmodern in that he is not a serial composer. Um, he is a composer who is looking for connections to things outside of traditional musical practice. He's, uh, I guess I would say a, um, a composer who is scientific, but not in the manner that one usually thought about science, say, from a composer like Milton Babbitt. Maybe there's a couple of different definitions of postmodernism being used here. Yes. Well, I think, as I said earlier, postmodernism, on the one hand, was a very particular movement and style and, a, in a way, a sort of collection of techniques that came to its height probably toward the end of the 20th century. Postmodernism as a stance is where we are now. Um, and that is a willingness to explore many different approaches to music. Uh, there's an enormous freedom, but there's also an enormous, I guess I would say almost indecision about which way to go. I mean, I see, you know, since I teach, I see many students who say, well, what will I do now? What do I, what am, what am I supposed to do? Well, if you don't have a given stylistic template that is given to you by your teachers, then you have to explore an unbelievable range of options to come up with answers. Now, by the way, I see composers doing this all the time. I see young composers doing this all the time, and I'm very, very encouraged by it. But I think that, say for Zanakis, Zanakis, kind of just blew my mind open about thinking of how music, in a sense, could come from anywhere. And I think that he was, his model, he was an architect, first and foremost. You know, the math and the um, stochastic music, which has statistical bases, are the things that are always talked about technically. But the fact that he was an architect, which, which was what really made his music distinctive and, and very personal. And I think that he gave a sense to me that you could use anything in your life that was passionate and important to you 
to become a composer and to structure your aesthetic outlook. And I think that even though like I was trained as a historian, but in a way I had more permission to do that from Zanakis than perhaps I had from any other teacher except for George Rockberg. It's not easy always to define postmodernism because what it means in music and what it means in philosophy seem to be very different things. Um, and your views on postmodernism intrigue me because you're, they're very concise and, and well put when I think it's, it's hard to do that for a lot of isms, but especially postmodernism. Uh, but you've also said that it's, quote, come and gone, but we're still living with the consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, very intriguing quote. Uh, could, could you expand more on that? Yes. And in a way, that goes back to my difference between it as a style, which has a particular set of techniques associated with it, and an aesthetic uh, and even larger conceptual attitude. We are now in the time where we have a view of the recent past where there was a time which was modern. And we are no longer in that. We are in something different. You know, I mean, you know, in a sense, it's the multiverse. There was a time when it looked like, you know, time was moving forward in a very specific way. And there was a teleological direction to art and culture and so forth. And now things are up for grabs. And, and we know that. We know how um, difficult it is to uh, come to any sort of decisive definition of who we are or where we are as you know, individuals and as a society and culture. That is one of the defining characteristics now of postmodernism. It's not just confusion. I think it's maybe a restructuring of the world so that it is not based on premises before that were, I guess, more or less positivist, that were based on the idea of progress. Now we're dealing with a world in which we have um, multiplicity, multivalence, many options, and the very existence of those multiple options is what is in fact the defining character of our world. And maybe that is one of the most important aspects of now what we're calling postmodernism. I want to loop back around to your early training. And you mentioned that you studied history uh, first and foremost in your educational career. Um, and that seems to be, to be an integral part of the Robert Carl lore, <laughs> that uh, this, this study of history first and foremost before being diverted uh, via Ives into music. Another quote from you, in my education, I chose outsiders as teachers. I believe this was in reference to someone like Jonathan Kramer, who was, of course, very influential. You took that class with Xenakis. In a more poetic sense, Ives as well. Like we, we learn from even those we don't directly study with. Rockberg, you mentioned, as something of an outsider after he shunned serialism. So what made you choose those outsiders? Well, it's interesting because it's one of those things when you look back at yourself at a certain time, you say, oh my gosh, I did that. I wasn't thinking of it at that time, like I want to study with outsiders, I want to study with mavericks. And by the way, I will add one more to that list, which is Ralph Shapey, who in the 80s and 90s had an enormous flourishing and now seems to be largely forgotten. You're not seeing performances, you know, uh, recordings have fallen off. Um, it's going to be interesting because he's a composer who is, I think, very much in the maverick tradition, but it's a highly... Um, it, it owes a fair amount to Verez, but like Verez, Schoenberg, Ruggles, all of them sort of come together in his music. And he was also very important to me. So I'm just adding him in, into the mix there. I didn't choose to study with outsiders. It was almost like it was obvious that I wanted to study with this or that composer. And say with Rockberg, it was only later I realized, oh my gosh, he was an outsider. He was like the man who alienated everybody in his circle by what he did, by, you know, claiming that uh, serialism was not only dead, but was, you know, uh, anti-human. It was at least anti-humanist. Um, and lots of people took offense at that. And, you know, blithely, I was like, sort of like, oh, wow, he wrote this amazing third string quartet. I want to work with him because, you know, it was a, in a way, a very original collage of the history of music. Though I will say that that piece above all is one that actually ironically, though in a kind of spiral way, has its own teleology. It moves from the present all the way back 
to a past, which is like the early 19th century, and then moves back to the present so that it doesn't deny um, where one was at that moment that it was written. Um, but that piece in particular was one that made me want to study with him. But you know, now I look back at it and I say, oh my gosh, all my composers were in one way or another sort of out, even if they were very well recognized, by the way, but they were outside of the mainstream in terms of their aesthetic stance and also their technique. Xenakis, when I got to Paris, and it was pure serendipity that I found out about the class he was teaching that I went to, and which was, and I always say this, this is a, a truth in advertising. I was not a private student of Xenakis. I was there for one year in a class with about five other people, which is close enough, I think, to claim him. And so I knew him at the time in that way, but it was, uh, yes, yeah, something that completely changed my outlook on form. But in Paris, he was a composer who was lauded. He had like the Festival d'Automne was devoted to his music, but also I was in a room with five other people who wanted to actually take his class. Everybody else was going to IRCOM to basically um, essentially curry up to Boulez because Boulez was a power source and Xenakis was not the power source. He was someone who was recognized but sort of kept at uh, arm's length. Um, a composer who I did study with, a wonderful composer named Betsy Jolas said, and I'm going to sort of take on her voice, forgive me, I'm a bit of a mimic, but she said, well, you know, every generation, we have a composer who we decide that we're going to celebrate, even though he's not part of our tradition, or even though he's not really one of us. You know, we had Berlioz, and we realized we made a terrible mistake with Berlioz. <laughs> and so, you know, Xenakis was a composer that they were going to make sure to recognize, because they knew he was great, even though if he was kind of counter to French ideals. Betsy Jolas is still alive. If she hears this, she may, you know, come and she's in her 90s and still is writing music and she's in great form and she may come and kill me. I think she was absolutely right. There's a degree of cultural self-awareness within French culture, which uh, allows a certain sort of both definition and generosity to say, you know, th this person really isn't, you know, part of our mainstream, but we better recognize him because egg may end up on our face. Zanakis was still outside of the tradition. Boulez was the definition of what French music was supposed to be at that time. And that was in 1980 to 1981, correct? Exactly. That's when I was there. Um, and of course, I think it, it, it more than continued throughout the next couple of decades. Um, Boulez only became more prominent and more powerful. He was, he was, in a sense, the Napoleon of new music. It's interesting to, to think that at that time you had Boulez representing the old tradition, as old as serialism could be, and you also have the spectral school coming up and presenting a, a, a totally new and, and, to me, very French sound as well, but completely distinct from that tradition. And then you also have room within that for an outsider like Zanakis. I think it speaks to the how rich the soil was for music there at the time. When I was in Paris in 1881, spectralism was really bursting onto the scene. There was a group called Itineraire, of whom the two most prominent members were Gérard Grisé and Tristan Murat. And Boulez was all in favor of them. He was definitely promoting them, because I think he saw that this was the next wave of French musical creation and thought that jived with his sense which was kind of which was rationalist of what was supposed to be you know french art because spectralism is on one hand enormously sensuous in its sound you know it's beautiful sounds and colors of course there's a deep connection to the overtone series which was very important to me when i heard it at the same time it was um, music that was amazingly rational you could bring out graphs, you could bring out spectral analyses, you can bring out printouts from the computer, and all of these things would also justify your music. So in that sense, it was, uh, I think, the right sort of combination of Gallic rationalism and sensualism. For someone who's as into serialism as Boulez, like the, the mathematical side of spectralism is in, in some sense more, more scientific and, and certainly more mathematical. Uh, and I do want to touch on how spectralism has 
or has not influenced your approach to music, because I know you use the harmonic series quite a bit. Um, but I do want to wrap up the early years a little bit uh, with an anonymous question I got. How did the knowledge you developed as a history student affect your perception on music or your taste in music? That is, as they say, a great question. I think that what studying history, and I, I should say that when I completed my undergraduate studies, I went on to graduate study in music. It was while I was an undergraduate that I, you know, in a sense transitioned. Um, I, um, I was a history major the whole time, but I uh, found myself, I think, as a musician, as a, as a composer. Um, but I think my experience of history, I, I would say it's two things. One is that it was uh, something that really opened me up to dialogue with the past. And, you know, for the first maybe decade and a half, maybe more, uh, maybe first dec two decades of my writing music, a lot of my music used quotation and collage or at least reference now and then I might rather say almost like commentary on top of other music um, because I was you know in a dialogue with it and indeed even now I say that one principle of my music is that I am in a um, robust argument with tradition and the idea of there being music that precedes me um, that I can both reference but then be in dialogue with is actually very stimulating to me and I like that. Um, so that's one thing uh, that that came from my came from my my study of history. Um, I think it gave me a certain tolerance for the past, um, and also it gave me a certain almost mystical sense when you think about all the lives that have preceded you. All of them, in most ways, similar to your own in the basics the poignancy of it, the poignancy of this endless kind of train of human cyclic development that's going on there. I find that very moving. And, you know, when I was, when I was a kid and I was growing up in the South, I was a Civil War buff. And I would, I dragged my parents to battlefields. Now, this is, this is sort of shameful to talk about now, but I found it, I look now and what I found about it was that there was something very mystical about being in this place where something quite horrific happened. It was now incredibly peaceful, often incredibly beautiful, but marked with these sort of, you know, monuments or a sign or a cannon or something like that that seemed to suggest that there was an event that had happened here in a different time and in a completely different context. And that superimposition of time that existed in a space. I look at it now and it makes sense to me in, as an artist. And in fact, it seems very musical to me as a composer. That was you know, some of the sort of thing that in terms of history made composition feel like not such a great changeover. The idea of time space, the an architecture of time, which of course what Xenakis was. Um, is also, I think, very tied to a historical sensibility. You mentioned earlier a, a lot about the teleology of music. Do you think that there is any music that is not teleological? Oh, yeah. I, I think there is music which, in a sense, creates a still point. I mean, music which is more, for instance, just simply drone-oriented. Um, that, in a sense, refuses to have harmonic motion in a traditional sense, I think is already challenging teleology. Um, there's a, gosh, there's a, a still point piece that I think even has that title by Bernd Alois Zimmermann. <laughs> There are pieces that came from the 60s that were really trying to avoid teleology. Uh, Stockhausen's Momenta is moment form pieces, which did it more by having, you know, a series of events that 
seemingly were unrelated that almost contradicted one another um, is another way of getting at this. But I, I, and then, you know, pieces like Pauline Oliveros's deep listening pieces, the pieces that she did with, especially with the deep listening trio, though, interestingly enough, as they move, they often have, I, I feel real affinity with them now and then because they move through what feels like sort of reimaginings of overtone relations off of different fundamentals so that there is a sort of new harmonic uh, teleology and rhythm that starts to develop there. But there are, um, I think there are many composers who, uh, and many types of music that um, refuse to accept any sort of traditional teleology. And I think mostly through drone and repetition, which was a key thing for minimalism. You write a lot in, in your book on Terry Riley's In C, which I have here. Um, and you've also spoken about this as, as well, just how groundbreaking that piece really was in reshaping everything that we know about the history of, of contemporary composition, even though the piece was, was some time ago. I think we still think of it as, the, as part of the contemporary era. And I do want to get, you use your mentioning of the harmonic series and harmonic relationships again to, to get to talking about your music, uh, because your harmonic approach really fascinates me because it is somewhat spectral, uh, but also not. I've heard you say that 12 tune equal temperament is good enough for rock and roll, which I don't, I can't remember if that's a quote of you on you or Ingram Marshall about you. Uh, Ingram Marshall might have said it, but I've said it. If so, I've appropriated his remark. I'd love for you to tell us about how you developed your harmonic approach, uh, and what techniques you developed along the way, how much you were influenced by, say, the spectralists that were doing their thing around 1980 when you were in Paris just how it got started. Cage made the remark, I think that Schoenberg told him that he had no sense of harmony and he was going to always be running up against a wall there. And I think Cage said, well, I'll just have to keep hitting my head against that wall all my life. I felt like that a good deal, at least early on. When I was taking um, uh, ear training, harmonic dictation was hell for me because a teacher would sit at a piano and would play chord progressions from a Bach chorale and everybody was busily writing down the Roman numerals. I could hear the tonic and the dominant, but everything else in between, I, I didn't have tools, at least at that point, to discover the function. Though I will say that if it stopped at any point and asked me what the next chord would be, I could usually arpeggiate it singing it. You know, I had the feeling that I understood the syntax and the template, but I didn't have the tools to represent it theoretically. The thing is that, you know, I always have felt that harmony is one of the most important things of music. You know, and it doesn't mean that you can't write a music that is primarily rhythmically based, for instance. You can choose your parameter, though I will say, and this is not very fashionable, but I will say that, you know, pitches and rhythm are still probably more determinative of individual character in works than other parameters. Uh, and I, I, I may get a lot of pushback from that, and I'm welcome to discuss it. But um, in a sense, that doesn't matter. Harmony was, for me, the thing that I wanted to explore and to try to understand. Um, there were several things that came together for me, and I think it was just sort of fortuitous you know, at the, at the time. Though it wasn't really till, I mean, so I was in Paris in 1980 to 81. I heard a lot of spectral music, and I was really taken by, in a way, how beautiful it was and how, quote unquote, natural it sounded. And it made me think, well, gee, you know, the overtone series, it's something that is in nature. As a matter of fact, it's so rational that you almost think that it's, you know, a, a, a divine um, dictum, except for the fact it has so many commas and things that are like landmines that are laid in it. Um, but I became, number one, impressed by that. Number two, the music of Ives, which if you listen to it, you can hear that the music is grounded in some sort of tonal practice, but that the um, chromaticism tends to exist more in the upper registers. It, it, it certainly exists as additional tones to blur the clarity, say, of the triadic structures, but it's really, the chromaticism really happens higher up so that you have a, a music that has open voicings low, 
more sort of thicker tonal voicings in the middle and chromatic voices up high. And that, of course, follows the overtone series, where by the time you get up to the top, you've got basically a big cluster, but it's up at top. And so as I came to know that music more and more and more and more deeply, it seemed obvious to me. And by the way, Ives, you know, his dad had Helmholtz in the library in the home as he was growing up. So he knew all of this. And then there was Henry Cowell, New Musical Resources, which is a wonderful book that I'm sure many, many of your viewers know already, in which he's tried to create a sort of unified field theory of music where everything in one sense was, a so was some sort of rhythm, not only the rhythms that we define by that term, but rhythm as a uh, frequency for any particular pitch, but also rhythm as the overtone series, the ratios of the frequencies of any sound, which creates color. And so that everything was some sort of relationship of different rhythms of vibration. And that I think um, made me think that there could be some sort of more unifying principle to work from. Um, so that's what, that's what led me you know, to explore what I did. And what I started to do, um, there's an early piece of mine for solo piano called From the Ground Up, which I actually wrote on a plane trip uh, from Hartford to um, the Twin Cities. It is a um, piece that uses a tune that I wrote intuitively, but the tune is in the middle voice. And then what it's used as is a kind of trigger to say for this note, it's going to fit within an overtone series with note X as a fundamental. And that creates a kind of sweep that encompasses the notes of that portion of the melody and then you move on and you determine another note being a partial within a different harmonic series. And now that it could be the same note, but it's a different partial, it's a common partial.
And that started to give me an idea of how to create music where one created a template. I have a piece called Changing My Spots, which uses this score. It's an open form piece, a little bit of an homage to NC. This is a piece that creates a kind of matrix of six overtone series where the notes are adjusted to, as I saw it, the closest point for each of the 12 chromatic pitches within the overtone series where they occur. So there's a series of fundamentals, six fundamentals. Each one of them follow the same pattern. It is close to the overtone series, but only using the 12 chromatic pitches. And so this was a, a combination of a kind of overtone conception with equal temperament tuning, which by the way, many people would say is a horrible bastard blend. And why on earth are you doing that? And all I will say is that as, as you use the term, it's close enough for rock and roll in certain pieces. And then what I've discovered is I've made other pieces, especially with the use of you know, various sorts of computer extensions, where you do have much more pure overtone just intonation. And I'm very happy with them too, but I like the fact that both of them can exist.
I was going to ask you a little bit later about how you chose whether to use more just intonation or to use equal temperament. You're not a composer who splits the difference and tries to use some other division of the octave or old-fashioned mean tone temperaments. It, it feels like you either are working in 12 equal or you're doing something with just intonation, be it a piece for double bass harmonics or trombone choir, um, or as you mentioned with, with electronics. Uh, so, so where in the composition process do you decide whether to go with one system of intonation or another? My approach to just intonation, you know, Kyle Gann has written a wonderful book about various temperamental intonational strategies. And he has a chapter about composers who actually use the overtone series as a way of structuring the harmonic content of a piece in different intonations and having more pure intervals derived from it. But that's very different from composers who will create scales derived from the overtone series, but that are meant to create particular type of intervals where there is a more just tuning of these intervals. Ben Johnston and Harry Parch fall more into that category. I remember that Kyle uh, put me in the category, uh, maybe it was Cowell, but also James Tenney and Lamont Young, which I'm very grateful for. You don't have quite a Lamont Young beard. Maybe that's your yeah, goal. Exactly. No, no, I, I keep it trimmed. This approach really isn't in a way most classic J.I. Just Intonation approach. Um, it's, it's one that's uh, more taking the overtone series as the sort of ground template for what happens rather than using um, intervals derived from it. Another concept that crops up in a lot of your music, the harmonic ladder. You take the overtone series, but then you subtract out of it any partial that's a duplicate of a lower one. You end up with like a, a, a low-fat 
<laughs> harmonic series. <laughs> yeah. How does that fit into your musical language? Well, I mean, it's been it's been something that I've felt able to explore almost endlessly. And I will say, by the way, that the latter defines the key notes of it, but the duplications can exist. It's just that I try maybe to create a hierarchy where the octave duplications of particular pitches at tunings will not be um, given the same sort of prominence as the ones that are each appearing above in a new form as you go through the 12 pitches. 12 pitches in ET or 12 pitches adjusted in JI. I should say that, for instance, in ET, I call the tritone basically the equivalent of the 11th partial. It is not. I know that. But it gives me a different sort of harmony in equal temperament, which is refreshing to me and I've, you know, continued to work with. I should emphasize that it's something that I've always sensed that if I got to the point where it was boring to me, I, sh I will not do it. Um, and even, it's not boring to me yet, but I, I'm writing a piece right now, which actually you see right behind me, which is a song cycle. It's, I'm not using the system at all in it because um, it would not work for what I want to do. Um, it's uh, a setting of poetry by a magnificent poet named Chase Twitchell, which is very zenny and the sense of elemental essentialism and silence that's in it is a completely different uh, sensibility than you know what my you know harmonic approach ordinarily is, which is actually kind of kind of lush. And so um, it's not something that I feel absolutely tied to and I would never want any composer, if they are fortunate enough to find a practice that really makes sense to them so that they can write multiple pieces in it, I would also never want these composers to feel as though they were then tied to that and they had to use that for every work because then you are you know, tethering yourself. You've given yourself the freedom to go away from it and come back to it as, as dictated by the piece. Uh, I, I do get the sense that you're, you're able to write pieces fairly quickly and this probably has something to do with finding something that really works for you and being able to explore it over and over. Well, I, I yes, uh, it's, it's funny because I never have thought of myself as a prolific composer, but now when I sort of look at my works list uh, and people say, oh my God, you're always writing music, you know, I, I guess I am. Um, it, but some pieces take a long time and some pieces come, you know, sort of in a flash. Uh, and I think that it's a, a thing where it really, first of all, does depend on the piece, but you're right. Um, the thing that this harmonic practice that I had, which yes, is called you know ladders, and uh, that's just my own term for it. It's, it's sort of, though I, now I look at it, they are 12 tone harmonic series based vertical equal temperament rows. Well, I mean, I've been around long enough that I can sling, um, sling terminology like that around right but um but it's but actually this is not unrelated to a composer that i don't feel enormous connection to namely schoenberg but there is you know the idea of there being a certain sort of pitch structure except it's vertical instead of linear that is determining uh the music it what it what it has given me is a sense that i can take it and reinterpret it in various ways. And one of the things, by the way, that I haven't mentioned is that, you know, when you have these different harmonics, vertical harmonic series, there are common partials between them. And what I have found that those partials, whether in um, ET or in uh, JI, are pivot tones, which allow for modulation. And that's one of the things with just intonation that has always been an issue is like, you know, how do you modulate? Well, of course, in pure JI, you will modulate and the relationships, the intervals will be different, but you can still make a connection from this quote unquote D to that, from this ladder to another. Uh, and it creates a, you know, it, it, it creates a sense of connection and a sense of progression. And then when you're in equal temperament, it's actually in a way more dramatic. Um, and it, it, one feels there being, you know, uh, progressions and connections and uh, arrivals, departures and arrivals that are analogous for me to more traditional tonal practice, but that aren't 
coming from uh, that are coming from a different place that are not coming from common practice at all. That practice, as you've gone through it and described it, has a few links to the past that I, I think of as well when you mentioned that. The first is Ben Johnston, who's able to do that in his extended just intonation, actually being able to pivot this slightly detuned D becomes this other partial, but that makes everything else so out of whack from equal temperament that it, it's a real miracle anyone's able to play it as well as they are. And the other one is Anton Webern, because you're working in a limited amount of fixed registration, although you're, you're much freer with it than Webern was. Yeah, well, I mean, no, and, and you know, it's very interesting that, that that's insightful of you, because it's something that I have sort of now and then thought, but just sort of like a, a vague thought in the back of my mind, but the idea of fixed and frozen register for um, pitches is important to me because, um, you know, registration in one sense is all for how anything harmonic is going to work. And it goes back to the overtone series. Of course, like if you're a jazzer, the classic line is it's all in the voicings. And, you know, I think that uh, the way that you voice your chords as a classically based composer, you know, is just as important. And you may have certain sorts of conceptual templates that lead you, that sort of shape your taste. They lead you in certain directions and then you have your taste interact with it and you start to come up with formulations that become more and more personal and now and then they actually violate the um, template you know, in some interesting way and maybe you become aware of it. Th this is one of the reasons why um, it's not, I, I think it's not a bad thing for a composer to have a theoretical bent. Um, especially, you know, if you're writing notes on paper, you know, if you're, if you're writing fixed music and you have time to contemplate it, having a certain understanding of how you put things together is, is a kind of um, exploration of self-awareness, almost a self-analysis that you're doing. And I can see that having worth. I'll say right now I'm reading a book by Fred Lairdahl, which is called Composition and Cognition, and it's the six block lectures that he gave at uh, University of California, Berkeley. It's very interesting to me because he's a composer who I admire, and he's really talking about the way that his, uh, we know him maybe more as a theorist. Bridge has, has put out almost his entire works in like multiple volumes on uh, C Bridge CDs. So he's worth, very much worth exploring because um, he's, uh, he's a very powerful and almost, and I would say intimidating theorist in terms of all that he knows and the way that he's trying to create an understanding of everything. But he, his music actually is very unbound and feels enormously natural. And I think that his um, thinking about music uh, theoretically has actually enriched his composition. I think it can happen. For other composers, it completely can choke you off. So I, it's not something that I, I would ever recommend as a, a sole way of going. But it might be, it might be fruitful. And for me, it had some benefits to think about what I'm doing theoretically and almost as an analysis of my work from piece to piece as I moved along as though I hadn't written it. I find that very useful for me as a composer. I couldn't say it better myself. I've used that within pieces and across pieces as well, uh, although I, I try to do something a little bit different. So what I can learn from one is not always applicable to the next one. You've talked about the transcendental versus humanistic spectrum before. Yeah. Uh, fascinating topic, getting into the Ives again with the transcendentalists. Uh, so how do you define those terms, and where do you feel that you fit into that on that spectrum? Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, um, and by the way, I can't help but notice that you have the old Stokowski recording of the Ives fourth behind you there. I'm, I'm, I'm pointing at it right now. <laughs> yes. There we go. Yeah. And I, I, I can see it over your shoulder, um, which was... There's more Ives down here. I just, I can only put so much on display at one time. Oh, I, actually, no, no, but it was, you know, that, that was, by the way, when I heard that, that blew my mind. <laughs> yes, that picture. Yes. But when I heard that piece and that recording, it absolutely blew my mind. And I think I might have even still been like a senior in high school when I heard it. I, I can't remember exactly, but it was... Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm getting off topic in one sense. Uh, look, music is, I've always felt that music is the way that the two hemispheres of the brain are united. Um, there is the, um, what I call the rant, uh, 
The transcendentalist side, what you could call the idealistic side, the formalist side, the structuralist side, the rational side, the abstract side. I mean, all of those are different facets of this aspect of music, which is creating sort of, I guess I would call it ideal or idealized structures of some sort, the music of the spheres, the sense, and, and, it, and it tends to a more spiritual side of things, though in definitely more of a Western rationalist way. And then on the other hand, music has an enormous visceral, emotional, and sensual impact. This is what people really love about it. You know, I, this is why people go to concerts and start, you know, screaming and moving. And uh, now and then they're showing off, but most of the times they're just having a very, very natural reaction to something that they love. And they're having this, um, this close, this intimate relationship with the sounds that they're hearing and they have to you know, express it. Um, that is what I would call the more humanistic side. So I would say maybe abstract and humanistic or um, transcendental, visceral. You know, the, but so where do I fit in on that? Well, I hope I'm somewhere not too far on either side of that spectrum. I don't, I don't want to be one or the other. I don't want you know, to be quote unquote binary on it. I, um, I have a tendency, I think, more toward the transcendental abstract, but I watch myself on it. And it's not just that I watch myself on it because I said, well, I shouldn't do that. It's more that I feel, but, you know, but I love this. I can't let, I can't shut this down because um, I love it so much. And so that sense of, um, having the things that are undeniable in terms of their pleasure has to have, uh, I think, a place in music making. One of the things that I've seen in, in, in my generation, not just in younger generations, but in consistently in generations of music making and composers, but I think I see it more in younger composers that they don't feel that they have to make a choice between these. There are composers you know, that, that you can love and uh, not feel bad about the fact that you love these various composers who at another time would be regarded as completely incompatible. And I mean, composers, not just, you know, from, uh, uh, from quote unquote classical music, from, from all traditions and from popular music. I think that, you know, if we're classical composers, yes, for popular music, we will tend to have uh, an appreciation more of those artists who want to push the boundaries in some ways. You know, obviously a classic example, which goes pretty extreme in the classical direction is Frank Zappa. But there are plenty of examples of composer songwriters who aren't in any way classical, but obviously have a very, very deep and probing relationship to everything that they create. That's what I actually always hope for is that music making won't become sort of anodyne. You know, it won't, it won't become bland. And, and we have enormous pressure um, societally and corporately to make music. And, I mean, and gosh, you know, with now with artificial intelligence, um, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, I, I have a former student who um, is teaching at an institution here in Hartford who actually I had lunch with and he had a brilliant observation. He says, I'm telling my students, he teaches composition. I'm telling my students right now give up on commercial music, you know, and, and this is like counter to everything, but he says, give up on commercial music because within maybe 10 years or less, something like chat GPT is going to be able to compose music for all sorts of uh, functions that are usually done by a commercial music composer. And, you know, and because it's ruled by the market, it'll be inexpensive. It'll be almost nothing to do it and you will have no role. And that the only thing you can do is to try to be as original as possible. And I think that's actually pretty brilliant in its, um, his name is Dan Roman, by the way, and he's a wonderful composer. That's a take on it that really puts it into a, a different realm and has a, a really sort of beautiful societal critique built into it. I thought some, I mean, as we all have about the rise of artificial intelligence just in the past 
several months. The more I've kind of messed around with them, the more I realized that there's a lot of formula involved just because of how they work. They collect all this information, they spit it back out. So Muzak, you could, there's a large enough corpus out there that it could be analyzed and you can imagine where that's going. But on the other hand, I also think of how um, you can build essentially artificial intelligence like programs in something like Max MSP. I've known for many years composers who will spend six months to two years working on a single patch, which seems to be making its own decisions. Of course, it's within certain parameters, but it can harmonize along with a melody. It can improvise counterpoint according to what it hears. And that's, that's very powerful. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm not as afraid of AI and what we do uh, as much as other other artists, like especially commercial artists. Well, yeah, that, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, what we as concert music composers do is that we try to create um, a product that is actually determined not by market but by personal taste, in the hopes that the originality of that taste will appeal to an audience that is looking for something different. And and this audience exists, I think, in every field and in every style of music. Um, it's a smaller audience, it's a select audience, but if it's enough to sustain an artist, that's all that matters. It's interesting, way back, <laughs> a few decades maybe, but a term that became very, um, very au courant for um, algorithmic music, in other words, music that, you know, created itself from a, from a rule-based set of uh, paradigms. Um, another is generative music, you know, and, and so that it generates its product and if it becomes more and more sort of self-conscious in the way that it creates and elaborates the rules for such generation then it becomes i guess what you might call emergent music where you have emergence of a system out of things that seemingly shouldn't come together to do anything but they do it is something that your generation is going to have to grapple with more than mine just because of you know the um just because of the uh, statistics, what am I looking for? The, you know, the, um, the mortality sheets. The, the actuarial tables to Thank you. come, that's, come that's, back to Ives and his that's innovations. That's the word I was looking for, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, a, few, a few final questions uh, as we wrap up here. In music composition of the 21st century, which, could you hold it up? I know you have a copy. Yes, I am. The, yes. Bloomsbury Press, highly recommended. In that book, you write that you see within popular music, quote, an emerging reaffirmation of the musical values I advocate. Again, like you, I reckon this to be a more common value among younger composers. So what are those values specifically? An appreciation of both the abstract and the sensual. Um, a experience of spiritual growth and amplitude in music. Um, a willingness to explore deep into technique in the hope of coming up with um, unexpected results, but results that may give satisfaction or pleasure. For me, a sense of space in the music. If a piece of music can be a kind of space that one as a listener can enter into and feel that there's enough room to breathe and grow and somehow come out of it amplified better than one was when one entered, I think that's a critical value. But I, and I think re this really can happen with any type of music. Final question is the question we all get asked. Um, I mean, I know that you have a, a symphonic premiere coming up, your seventh symphony, uh, to finish off your time at heart. Um, the question always being, you know, what are you up to these days. So uh, what's, uh, what's the Seventh Symphony about? It's called Infinity Avenue, but that's a title of actually a series of pieces I've written. And it's based on a max patch, which uses precisely what we've been talking about, a series of ladders, six ladders that are in just intonation, which can all be triggered. So it, you have end up with 72 pitches. They can all be triggered from the laptop. And that is a kind of sonic glue that moves through the piece and that, you know, morphs through the piece with a, a chamber ensemble of, I believe, um, 16 instruments and three voices. It's about a half hour long. And it's, it's definitely one of the more most difficult and abstract pieces that I've written. This piece 
started out as a patch that I then used in live performance, that then was used in installations, could go on for actually hours. Then for a small improvising ensemble with a laptop conductor. rendition of it, which is not meant to be the um, definitive one. iterations exist along the way, but I'm not planning on another iteration of it. I feel like I've, I've moved all the way through the possibilities of this piece, but it's been, you know, probably about a ma matter of, you know, six or seven years uh, going through these various ones. And I've been writing a lot of other pieces along the way, by the way. <laughs> so it's not just this in my life. It sounds like a, a fitting summation of your uh, storied career at heart. So yes, it is. It's a summation, not of my career, but of my career at heart. Thank you very much. Yes. You, you said it, you said it perfectly. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> well, I'm sure that you're always going to be up to something. So after after your retirement, what's what's next? Oh boy, projects, uh, travel. Yeah, uh, all of the above. I, I'm, you know, I was just sort of thinking since this piece, which was written actually during the pandemic, but you know, I've I've written two symphonies, two song cycles, a string quartet, a solo guitar piece electric guitar piece, there's probably something else along the way that I'm not even thinking about. And I'm writing, a, yeah, I, one of the song cycles I'm writing right now. So I'm, I think I'm keeping, keeping it up, but also when you've written a certain amount of music, you realize you don't have to write so much and you really want to write what's necessary. You know, what's necessary and of value to you and take a little more, perhaps take a little more time for it. And so if I would say anything, that's maybe what as I become a freelance composer, that's that's what I'm um, that's what I'm looking at. Well, thank you so very much for your time, Thomas. It's a it's a delight, and may I just say to all of your viewership that I have been enjoying your videos enormously, and it's an honor to be in your space today.